Good morning, everyone. I'm standing here in front of this seven female rat sign thing. <laughs> Been there, done that, had those t-shirts, stick insects and the lot. Definitely not me volunteering for that. It's good to be here. Uh, it's good to actually explore this story of Stephen. I wonder how many of you at some point or other have said, I can't stand martyrs. Come on, am I the only one? <laughs> Be honest. You all say that. I can't stand martyrs. Because when we think of that in today's context, we think about a martyr as someone who's self-righteous and full of themselves and always makes a big deal out of everything they do. Do you know those kind of people? You ask them to do something and you always wish you hadn't. Uh, um, they let you know how much effort they've put into everything in the church. We, we all know about that, don't we? Um, but this guy wasn't like that at all. This is the story of the first Christian martyr, the deacon Stephen. I don't actually think God can stand the kind of martyry type thing I was saying either. Uh, but I think God loved Stephen. In fact, I know that God loves Stephen. And I hope you'll enjoy finding out a bit more about him and his story. He's a great guy. His name's Greek and it means crown or garland. And we celebrate his feast day on the 26th of December, Boxing Day. Remember, good King Wenceslas last went out on the feast of Stephen. Thank you. Um, and the whole point of that story is that it was tradition to go out on that day with food boxes, parcels for those who were in need. Stuff perhaps that was left over from Christmas, but rather than throwing it away, uh, the richer people would give it to those who were poor, to their servants. Um, and so uh, Stephen was appointed uh, to give food parcels and to care for those people in need. That's a very simplistic way. The early church was growing and many had become Christians who were from different countries. And we are told that the Hellenistic Jews, the, the Greek-speaking Jews, remember any of you went to Greece for holidays a long time ago? It used to say Hellas on the stamps if you collected stamps as a kid, like I did. It means Greece. They were restless and complaining that the Greek-speaking Jewish widows were not being treated fairly in the food distribution. We never make a fuss when we think we're not treated fairly, do we? No. And the context was that they were Jews, but they spoke Greek, because Greek was the international trading language, just like English used to be, but according to Claude Juncker, isn't anymore. Um, and the important thing to recognize is that when Jews became Christians, when they converted to become followers of Jesus Christ, their families would have disowned them. I know this very well, because actually I was in love with a Jewish man uh, when I was in my late 20s. I came to realize after a year of studying Judaism at the West London Synagogue uh, that whatever I did, I would never be acceptable to his family. And everyone who knew his family uh, in the city that he came from uh, would not have done business with him. Uh, people would have treated him as dead if he had married a woman who wasn't a Jew. Now that's quite extreme, you might say, but there are still some of that around. Um, and so these people weren't necessarily people who'd originally been poor, but if they were slaves, then they lost their livelihood if they stopped being slaves. Do you understand? So actually becoming Christians meant they lost everything. And that's true today. In the 21st century, that's what happens in Pakistan, in India, in other places. If people become Christians, they actually aren't just changing their religion, they're cut off from their family, their lives may be in danger, and they lose their livelihood. So that's the context in which this was happening. That's the price of converting to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So the apostles appointed seven deacons. It was a clever move choosing uh, Greek people, uh, Greek-speaking people, to do this. Stephen is a Greek name, and he was chosen because he would have understood the needs of these people and could communicate with them. All of the names are Greek names of those seven deacons. But that's not all we know about Stephen. We're told he was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom that the apostles laid hand on, hands on these seven men and commissioned them to care for the pastoral business so that the apostles were free for preaching and teaching God's word. 
Chapter 6, verse 8, tells us that Stephen performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. He was full of God's grace and the power which raised Jesus from the dead. Stephen, in his pastoral and business role, was vital to the life and ministry and witness of the naturally supernatural early Christian church. And we're told that men from the synagogue of the freedmen, that is exactly people who had been slaves and were, had been set free um, and, uh, because they could buy their freedom or uh, uh, relatives could uh, set them free by paying for them or doing something to set them free. And this was a place where people liked to come to debate and to argue with him. And that none of these people could stand against Stephen's wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit through speaking through him. I'm sure that Stephen would remember the words of Jesus. They're words I always think of whenever I feel nervous, like coming to speak here today. Which is, uh, Jesus said to his apostles, don't ever be afraid when you're called to give an account of yourself to kings and governors, because I will give you the words to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. That's part of his teaching in Luke 12 about the Holy Spirit. And Stephen trusted this word, and he spoke out the truth with boldness and with grace. So, just as had happened with Jesus, those who opposed the teachings of Jesus, through Stephen, plotted to tell lies against Stephen. They accused him of blasphemy, and he was brought before the high priest. Stephen's reply is well worth reading, as well as filling in your contact form. Can I suggest that you look at the whole of the passage of uh, Acts 7 before you go to bed tonight. Because what follows in Acts 7 is the most amazing exposition and explanation of salvation history, of God at work all through history, from Abraham to Jesus. Just like Jesus had done with the disciples on the Emmaus Road, Stephen's explaining it, he's unpacking the scriptures or unlocking them, as we might say today. And no doubt, some of the people who heard him had their hearts set on fire and may have been converted. But for others, it raised hate and venomous anger in their hearts against Stephen as he was criticizing them. You see, the Jews at that time were very arrogant. They believed that they were the chosen people, that they had got God's message in the law and the prophets, but they thought it was just for them not for anybody else. They didn't make it easy for anyone to convert to becoming a Jew. And Stephen accused them of persecuting the prophets, God's messengers throughout their history, just as Jesus had accused them. And they weren't happy chappies. He echoes the word of God to Moses in Exodus 32, when God says to the Israelites that they were a stiff-necked people. Let me tell you a story. 20 years ago, uh, it was the lectionary lesson for a Sunday was to preach about that passage in Exodus when uh, Moses went back up the mountain after they'd uh, destroyed, uh, you know, the, the golden calf. You know the story. Um, and God says to Moses, these are a stiff-necked people. Well, I was preparing to preach for this particular event and my family uh, were, uh, went to Barmouth in Wales. Um, without telling you all the details, some of which are quite funny, but you don't need to know them to get the point. Uh, the point was that we'd all been windsurfing. I was covered in suntan lotion. We stayed out late because it was a beautiful evening and uh, was no time to have the barbecue. So we went for a takeaway pizza. And there was a queue for the pizzas, a long wait. So we went to the pub for a drink while we were waiting for the pizza and I sat down on one of these bench seats outside the pub while my husband went in to get the drink and as I sat down I had so much suntan stuff still on me that I slipped off the thing, <laughs> fell backwards uh, and actually did have a hairline fracture of one of the vertebrae in my neck so I had to get blue lighted to uh, Bangor Hospital and never did get to eat the pizza and there's lots of other funny bits to that but you don't need to know. But the point was that the following Sunday, I'm standing in church with a collar like this on. Unfortunately, it was only a very minor fracture, but it was very painful. But do you get the point? So there I was, visual aid, stiff-necked people. 
Um, so this week, in preparation for today, I've been very careful to avoid pizzas and suntan lotion. I didn't really think that uh, uh, Christchurch needed a visual aid. So all through his speech, Stephen condemns the Jews for distorting the message of God's love. And he moves progressively from implicit uh, condemnation of them to being explicit, and it calls them stiff-necked people. So they were enraged. They shook their fists at Stephen, but he was so full of the Holy Spirit, he wasn't afraid of anyone who could hurt his body. And he'd almost certainly heard Jesus say, words recorded in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be of the afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And so Stephen wasn't afraid. He was filled with courage and boldness, supernatural courage and boldness. He looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God. And uh, chapter 7, verse 55, he says, I look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honour at God's right hand. How good is that? And uh, the Son of Man was clearly a Jewish term for the Messiah, and that was the last straw for the Sanhedrin, for the high priest and the elders and teachers of the Jewish law. They put their hands over their ears, they drowned out what he was saying with shouts, and they rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city of Jerusalem, and they began to stone him. They took off their coats as they did so, and they were told uh, uh, that they, and we're told that they laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Heard of him before? And they stoned Stephen to death. It wasn't a legal trial, just the same as Jesus' trial wasn't legal. It was a kangaroo court. Interestingly enough, I used to be the minister at Standish Methodist Church. When John Wesley preached at Standish, uh, it's in the parish records of St. Wilfred's Church of England uh, that they had the bells rang, uh, f ringing for three hours to drown him out. And they did literally throw stones at him uh, and the other people who were part of that evangelical revival um, and threw them out of Standish. You're not going to do that to me today. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as they stoned uh, Stephen to death, Stephen prayed. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Do Stephen's last dying words remind you of anybody else's dying words? The words of Jesus, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Wow. Wow. What supernatural power at work in and through this man, Stephen, and his role as a deacon, one who serves in the early church. So what was the impact of Stephen's death? Well, we're told uh, right from the beginning of chapter 8 that persecution began in the church from that day. It was an important moment and changed the course of history. And Jesus had said... Blessed are you when you are persecuted for my sake. We're also told that Saul was one of the official witnesses at the killing of Stephen. And we know that he was from Tarsus, which is in Sicilia, one of those places uh, which Angela read out for us, uh, from which the Hellenistic Jews came into this uh, synagogue of the freedmen. So Paul will have encountered uh, um, Stephen. And we know that later on, Stephen, uh, uh, sorry, Paul, who had seen Stephen die, encountered Jesus for himself on the Damascus Road and had such an amazing conversion experience. His name changed, his life changed. But in the meantime, before he did that, he zealously persecuted Christians. But I imagine he never ever forgot the face of Stephen. Do you remember it said he was like an angel? Um, shone with the Shekinah glory of God. Um, and uh, St. Augustine says uh, that the church owes Paul to Stephen. He was given a, a mission and a purpose, Paul, uh, preaching to the Gentiles. And in his letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, he writes 
For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Uh, and I believe that what he'd seen in Stephen would have influenced him. Stephen's courage and boldness in the face of adversity. And echoing in his mind those words of Stephen, don't hold this charge against them. The forgiveness was probably the most powerful thing of all. I remember hearing a man called Simon Gillibund, who was in Burundi. Um, some of you may have heard him speak or read some of his books. He spoke at uh, Easter People many years ago, young man then, full of, of, of energy, and he's done the most amazing things in Burundi. Um, he said, I'm immortal until God says otherwise. Isn't that incredible? And do you know there are more martyrs, there have been more martyrs in the 20th century than in the previous 19 put together? Did you know that? It's true. Absolutely true. Today, there are people whose uh, uh, lives are at risk because of professing faith. I wonder how many of us would be here today if we thought our lives were in danger for coming to church this morning. Because if we're not afraid to die, then we're not afraid to live. We live with abundant life, the promise that Jesus gives us, life in all its fullness. So what, you might say, what about us here today? What's the point of this in terms of week three of being a naturally supernatural church? What do you think is worth dying for? We say to die for, don't we? Very casually. And if you and I were on trial today, would there be enough evidence to convict us from our lives that we are followers of Jesus Christ? Well, we've actually got a Stephen here today. I think you're a V, not a PH, is that right? Steve the vicar. Don't make him a martyr. <laughs> this man is full of wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit. He's well respected and he's, yet he's humble, he's truthful, and he's faithful, and he's inspirational. I've been involved in charismatic renewal for many years, and I've seen many healings. I've prayed once and half a room fell over. I've seen people healed, I've experienced healing in my life. I've been anointed and commissioned, but sometimes discouraged, and sometimes, as Steve described last week, disappointed with church, especially after going to theological cemetery twice, once, once as a spice, that's what my husband used to call me rather than spouse, um, and uh, you can identify with that, can't you, and, uh, and once as a student. You need to run with uh, your leadership if you want to be a naturally supernatural church. When I was in Standish, uh, the church went through the most amazing renewal and was growing. People came to faith. It was incredible. But there were people who didn't want anything to change, just like those Jewish leaders that put uh, Stephen on trial. They, wanted, they didn't want anybody to rock the boat. Um, and sadly, they made it very difficult. And after I was appointed somewhere else, the church stagnated. But I'm glad to say that every single one of the people that came to faith in Jesus Christ in that time is now worshipping somewhere else and I thank God for that. I thank God for that. When my husband died at his funeral, uh, somebody came and spoke to me afterwards from one of the churches that he'd ministered at and said to me, looking quite peeved, believe it or not, this person actually said to me, I think Queen's Hall in Wigan got the best of Tim. You fancy saying that to me in that situation? And I said, Yes, I think they did, but you know, Tim wasn't any different when he was there than he was with you. The difference was they were willing to run with him. <laughs> run with this guy. Run with the people in your congregation who've got inspiration. Capture that vision. Go to the thing. Go to that weekend. It'll change your life. Go to New Wine. Go to the healing days he's running. It's not about him as a person. In fact, that would be dangerous. Uh, it's about the initiative that there is in the church to move. Because do you know what? The church is already supernatural. 
There's a minister who's moved here recently, Michael Aguche uh, from Nigeria. He's the minister of Leyland Road. Uh, the first week he was there, somebody, I don't actually know who it was, I don't want to know who it was, apparently said to him, I don't want anything supernatural happening here. <laughs> God is supernatural. And the whole point about being naturally supernatural is it just comes naturally to us. It isn't something we have, it's not an optional extra. Uh, we're called to risky living. We're called uh, to have expectation, to have faith, to move out of our comfort zone, to let the wind of the Holy Spirit blow, to let the Holy Spirit take control. We sing it, but we don't always mean it. And as we, we sometimes feel, well, we don't really want the Holy Spirit to mess up my little area of influence. We can have the Holy Spirit, but I still want to arrange the flowers like I've always arranged the flowers. And, you know, the milk has to go in the teapot, not in the cup. Or, and those are some of the things that actually we fall, we fall out about. Um, but what we need is never going to work unless you have humility and obedience. And remember, the key thing about Stephen was he preached forgiveness. And I want to ask you this morning, is there anybody here who's holding on to unforgiveness? Because God isn't going to really work in your life unless you at least reach the point where you say, Lord, I want to let this go. It's hard to let it go. I know what that feels like. But help me. I want to let it go. And it's not about letting other people off the hook. It's about letting ourselves off the hook so that we're free in a free relation because we've been forgiven so much ourselves. And when we know that, how can we withhold forgiveness against others? But to be naturally supernatural, my friends, it's vital that we don't just seek the gifts of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit. And they're on the screen. Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23. Um, we need the fruit of the Spirit. Supernatural churches, marks of a supernatural church, and supernatural love, supernatural grace, supernatural peace, supernatural uh, reconciliation, supernatural healing, all of these things are really, really important. Just to finish, and this, if you don't remember anything else, try to remember what I'm saying now. You see, Stephen didn't look at the faces of the people that were distorted by rage. He didn't focus on the people who disagreed with him. Did you notice that? What did he do? He looked to Jesus. He saw the risen Jesus. And we fall down when there's dissent or division. If we focus on that, we get distracted and we need to stay with the vision of Jesus and what he can and does want to do. And when we seek things like healing, which we talked about last Sunday, our motivation needs to be for compassion for those who are suffering. Because if we have the gifts of the Spirit without the fruit of the Spirit growing within us, then actually we can go off at a tangent and lose track. And the two things come together. Last week, Steve, you talked about coming to faith through your friend who was physically healed. I came to faith pretty much about the same time as you, I think, through encountering people who had an authentic, living faith. People whose lives were supernaturally natural, or naturally supernatural. Does that make sense? That what they were was who they were all through the week. And I wanted what they had. Being naturally supernatural means being open to the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. And just finally, remember I said to you his name was Crown or Garland, Stephen's name. We're promised in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I love this. I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Is that worth living for? Yes. One or two of you think it is. Is that worth living for? Yes. Is that worth dying for? Yes. And if you're not afraid to die, are you afraid to live? No. no. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, open our hearts, our minds, our spirit to you. We want that boldness and courage that Stephen had. 
We don't all get called to be evangelists or preachers or into a healing ministry, but all of us are called to do whatever we do in the power of your Holy Spirit, to serve you faithfully. So pour out your Holy Spirit on each and every one of us that we may live our lives in love, in joy and peace, and that the fruit of your spirit may grow in and through us and reach out through this church into our community, that we may be a healing place in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.